All right, welcome everybody here in person. Welcome those of you live streaming. We are going to get started now, um, so settle in. If you are here in person, we're happy to have you. If you're live streaming, um, so that I know that you're here, please send me an email with your favorite pizza topping so that I can take attendance. Um, if you are live streaming, then know that at 4.30, we're going to play laser tag in the school. So drive on over here as soon as this is done and join us. Um, Today, for our final speaker this year, we are very happy to have Andy Wagenbach. You are currently the uh, youth minister at St. Charles Borromeo up in New Brighton, right? Um, he's also a leader um, in youth ministry in the Archdiocese. He's been very helpful to me and Addy and a lot of youth ministers. So uh, we are very excited to have him here talking about the subject of science and religion. So uh, everybody, welcome Andy, and thanks again for being here. Perfect. Thank you. Your applause was amazing for that many of you. I'm impressed. It's good to see you all. Thanks for coming. How many people do you think are live streaming? If you had to guess. Was 80? No. Okay, like 20? 10? Something like that. Okay, awesome. That's great. Well, like, like Joe said, my name is Andy Wagenbach, and I have been in youth ministry now for, uh, let's see, 11 years. 11 years. That's a long time. Uh, and they asked me to give this talk. I've never given a talk, really, ever, uh, on this specific topic, specifically like science and reason. And the question they kind of gave me was, is God necessary if we have science? Have you ever thought about that before? I don't know that I've ever really thought about that. <laughs> we're, we're walking around scanning people uh, because we see the value of science, right? We, we wouldn't have had that years ago, right? That you could walk up. How, how many people ever used a thermometer that they put under their tongue? Okay. Okay. How many people ever used, uh, no, I won't go there. Okay. There's other thermometers, right? That have been used for a long, long time. And thermometers, do you know what was in the original thermometer? Some guy figured it out that you could use a certain substance inside of, the therm inside of a thermometer that when it would get warmer, it would go up and down. And it's actually a very poisonous thing. Uh, does anyone know what it was? Mercury, right? Mercury was inside of thermometers. One time, my brother and I, he thought I was sick. I, didn't, I don't think I was sick. I was like 10 and he was 12. We would get left home a lot because both my parents worked. And so we would like randomly do stuff, right? And he thought I was sick one day and he's like, uh, he's like, you're sick. We need to take your temperature. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not sick. Like, I'm fine, you know? And so he puts the thermometer in my mouth and I'm sitting there and you know how long you're supposed to wait? Has anyone ever used one that, you know, they don't, now that's like auto, you touch it and it's like instant. You know how long you're supposed to wait to get the thermometer to go up or down? None of you are old enough probably for these things. Like my grandma gave us this thermometer. It was super old, janky. Like the thing tasted funny. It tasted like old people's like mouths. I don't know. It was really weird. Hopefully they like washed it in between the times. But anyway, like I've had this thing in my mouth and I was waiting and I was like, it hasn't been three minutes because you're supposed to wait three minutes until, until you took it out and then you could look at it. And like the numbers were so old that you couldn't really tell. You were like, yeah, you're a little over a hundred, you know, like you didn't know exactly where you were or how far, but I'm holding it because it wasn't like long enough, right? It, it, I, I knew it hadn't been three minutes. And my brother's like, come on, give it to me. And he grabs it and he actually broke it off in my mouth. And you know what happened when he broke it off in my mouth? Like where'd all the mercury go, right? And he actually cut, you know, the little thing under your tongue? Uh -huh. He cut mine. Like it, it sliced it. Like that feels awful. It did. It did feel awful, right? And the first thought that I had was like, I'm going to die of mercury poisoning. Like I know what happens to people who get mercury poisoning. Like they die. Okay. Like that was totally my first thought. And he, he cut the bottom of my tongue, right? So I'm bleeding and there's mercury. Luckily, actually it's lucky he cut it because the blood actually washed all the mercury out because I'm like spitting it all out and like it didn't have any mercury poison or anything as I know of. Maybe I'm just, maybe that's why I'm the way I am. I don't know. But uh, I didn't have any poisoning. I didn't die, right? The coolest part about this is I can now touch, you know, the hangy ball in the back of your throat? I can touch that with my tongue now and I can actually go up around the sides of it because the little connector thing didn't grow back, right? And so it's like super loosey-goosey in there. But it's amazing. It's amazing, right, that our bodies can do that without any help. Like, I didn't get stitches on my tongue. I, I, didn't, I didn't go to the doctor even. You know, like, I didn't start going like, that. if I would have done that, they probably would have been like, we need to go to the doctor. You probably have mercury poisoning, right? But the coolest part about talking this, about this question, is God necessary? Well, it starts asking the question, what is necessary, right? What do we need? What, what is absolutely necessary for us to exist, for us to be alive, for us to be here in this moment right now? Someone said that their mom made them come to this. 
Well, you still had a choice, right? You could have like laid down, kicked your feet, and cried on the floor like little kids, right? And been like, I'm not going, right? Like I have four sons. I have a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, a 6-year-old, and a 4-year-old, right? And if they don't want to do something, a lot of times it's hard to make them, right? Because we always really have a choice when it comes to most things, uh, to come, to not to come, to stay, to not to stay, to eat those delicious snacks and play laser tag or not and miss out on all the fun, right? Like we have choices and we have the ability to choose what we like, what we don't like. And sometimes we don't always choose our likes. How many people think that pepperoni pizza is the best kind of pizza? No one. All right, cheese? We'll go cheat. Cheese, I got one. Sausage? Like, do you guys eat pizza? Okay, no. Who doesn't like pizza? Okay, what kind of you don't? You're, uh, what kind of pizza do you like? Hawaiian. Okay, you know our archbishop said. Our archbishop said this at an Archdiocesan Youth Day event. I want to share it with you. This is the archbishop speaking. He said that if pineapple was supposed to be on pizzas, then there would be pineapple trees in Italy where pizza came from. That was the archbishop's words. Those aren't, those aren't my words. I don't know. You can think about that, pray about it, you know, like come to terms with, no, my wife loves pineapple pizza. I, I don't mind. It's not a huge deal, but I just thought it was interesting that he said it that way. Uh, but before we get too far into here and we talk about science or reason and we talk about faith, because we kind of we kind of put them in two different camps. Like over here, we'll put reason, science, intelligence, understanding, knowledge, right? All those things. And then over here, we have like faith, and it's like, oh, this is great. It's kind of like mystical and spiritual. And there's just a lot of like unknown. Like you kind of have to have this, you have to have faith to understand this side of it, right? Because when I was a kid, so many times I said to people, if God would just show up, I could believe in him. Like if he just walked through the door and he's like, hey, Andy, what's up? It's me, Jesus. I'd be like, I can believe now, right? Like he just walked through those doors. And I struggled with that a lot growing up. And when I was in confirmation, I really didn't care about my faith. I didn't care about what the people were teaching me or what the church was about because I really didn't have a relationship with Jesus, right? I didn't know. I knew a lot of the stuff about faith and religion, but I didn't know Jesus, right? And I think that's the difference, okay? And so when we talk about intellect, science, reason, faith, the stuff we can come to rationally, physically, and then we have this spiritual reality over here, and we have all this stuff that kind of, it has to be a faith experience. Like there has to be something more, like you can't always like touch it, taste it, feel it, sense it, right? Sometimes it's hard to believe when you go up and you say, they say the body of Christ and you say amen, which means so be it. Yes, I believe. So when you say amen, be careful what you're saying amen to, right? Um, when they say the body of Christ and you look at it, it kind of looks the same. Have you seen the consecrated host before mass? You know, when they like, have you ever brought up the gifts? Anyone ever brought up the gifts? Okay, we don't bring up the gifts anymore, which I'm really sad about. I love bringing up the gifts. My kids love bringing up the gifts. They fight over, like they're literally fighting over who gets to bring up the gifts. And I'm like, dude, this is church. You know what I mean? Like stop fighting in front of the church. And everyone's like, they're trying to bring up, you know, the, the gifts. And you look at the bread in the bowl and it looks just like it. And then you, you bring it up and Father does consecration and all the things that the priest does for the Mass. And it looks the same, pretty much. And I remember my, uh, my, my, what is he now? He's six years old. I remember I came back from receiving communion one time, and this is when we could re still receive the precious blood. And I came back and I knelt down. And I knelt down and I was, I was praying, you know, really trying to be prayerful. And it's real quiet because, you know, the, the choir is receiving communion, so there's no music going on. And my, he's five at the time, and he's like, Dad, and everyone can hear him, right? Because he's like whispering. And he's like, Dad, your breath smells like Jesus, right? Like, and, and he doesn't know. He's never received Jesus. He's never received communion, right? But he knows that I believe that that's Jesus. And I went and received it. And then I came back and I knelt down. And that smell that he was smelling, which was the wine, right? The precious blood of God, it wasn't the wine anymore. It smelled like wine. It tasted like wine. But it was transubstantiated. It was actually a different substance, and so we're going to talk about this tonight, okay? Like, how can we believe, if we believe in science and we believe all that our intellect and reason tells us, how can we believe in a God that seems, that seems to not be a physical reality? That's kind of the question we're asking. Is God necessary in my day in, day in, day out life, right? And before we do that, I want to show you a, a movie clip. How many of you have seen Inside Out before? Do you like it? Okay, who's your favorite character? The, of the emotions, you know what I mean? Which, which one? You haven't seen it in a long time? It's okay. How, anyone else remember any of the guys? You don't have to name them. Just what are the, uh, I, I really enjoy Disgust. 
like disgust. And, and I love how it says it in here that she saves you from things, right? Like disgust is one of those people that you're like, oh, that's gross. I'm not going to eat that poisoned, you know, and then it says socially poisoned, like keeps you away from socially being poisoned as well. So we're going to watch this clip because this is, I think, shows a lot about our emotions, right? Because when we start talking about science and we start talking about our reason, we have to talk about the things that then inform the choices we make, right? So when, when you see a pizza that does not have pineapple on it, maybe it has mushrooms or, or black olives or green peppers or just gross things, what is the first thought you have when you see that disgusting pizza, right? Like you're like, oh, I don't want that one, right? You don't like it. You don't care for it. You're not going to pick it. And if there's a pineapple pizza or a Hawaiian pizza, you're going to pick that one because you like that, right? And now is that a scientific reality that you're like, I like pineapple pizza. I don't like this one. I mean, kind of, right? But it's more of a preference, more of like a feeling. It's more of like a, yeah, you know what your taste buds like. You know what they don't like. But I think sometimes we associate what we feel with reason. And that's a dangerous thing, right? And we're going to see in this clip kind of why that's dangerous. Okay, so I, I wanted to show, maybe you can go back to it, where it's all of the characters, right? So all these emotions. We got, a, we got a, an airplane. And instantly the anger's gone, and she's like, all right, I'll try it, right? I think sometimes we allow our emotions to run the show, okay? And that's, that's what this movie is showing. It's showing that inside of every single person in this world, there is emotion, right? So on this, does anyone know who this one is over here on the left? Fear, right? Then you have sadness, joy, disgust, and anger, right? These are kind of the, the five like baseline emotions. You either like things or you don't. That's kind of the disgust. You're afraid of things. Who's afraid of heights? Who's afraid of the dark? Still, who was afraid of the dark? Because we're not anymore. I'm still afraid of the dark. Okay, like who, uh, who gets angry sometimes? You never get angry? Come on, ever? You're like the most chill guy ever. You never get angry? Okay, sometimes, all right? Like some people get angry, right? We get angry and that's just a reality, okay? I was driving over here and this lady cut me off. And I started to get angry and then I was like, Jesus help me. And I was like, okay, I'm okay, right? And ultimately you see in this, you see in this that these emotions can sometimes run the show so much that they make you react. Did you know that animals, animals don't have a rational soul? That's not to say that they're not alive or animated or have a soul. They don't have a rational soul. What do we mean by that? Okay, so there's a difference. Is there a difference between me and your dog? Or am I the same as your dog? What do you think? Does your dog make a choice based on, you know, I really would love some like filet mignon dog food instead of the kibbles and bits stuff. You know, like this is just, what is this? I'm not eating this stuff. You know, we don't, their dog is not making a decision based on like thinking through it. They, if you place food in front of a dog, they will eat it, right? It, it, they might have preferences. They might like it more than others. But if you put food in front of a dog, almost more often than not, and the dog is hungry, what is that dog going to do? Eat it. We just went through Lent, right? How many of you gave up sweets? Chocolate, snacking between meals. How many people gave up nothing? Okay, or I don't know. Any, what, we give things up because we have control, right? We have control over our emotions. When we're hungry, we don't have to eat in this moment, right? We, we want to, we desire it. How many of you ever are like, man, if I don't get Chipotle in the next like 20 minutes, I'm going to lose it, right? Like sometimes my kids are like, it's snack time and this little red guy comes out and he like lights on fire. My four-year-old, like he is crazy, okay? Like he, he's like this guy pretty much. And, and food is one of those triggers. How many people get kind of frustrated or angry when they're hungry? That's totally me, right? Like when you're hungry, you can't control yourself as much, right? And then how many of you make your best choices uh, when you're sad and depressed? Anyone? Anyone? You're sad and depressed, you're like... <laughs> I'm going to change the world. You know what I mean? Like that, no one ever thinks that when they're sad and depressed, like I'm going to go change the world right now. No, you sit in your room, you shut the doors and you get your emo phase on. You listen to like sad music. You know what I mean? Like that's what we all do because sadness doesn't maybe make us want to do something that's going to be life changing. Now in this movie, Joy takes over and she's like the leader and she doesn't realize that the emotions actually add in uh, flavor to all the different things that her, her moments of joy or the core, emo, the core memories that they lose, uh, they actually have sadness, joy, all the emotions within them, okay? 
why are we starting at emotions if we're supposed to be talking about science, right? Well, because until we understand ourselves, I don't know if we can answer the question, is God necessary? Because I, you have to ask the question, uh, what do you need? What is necessary, okay? Um, we just went through, like I said, Lent. And, and I want us just to think about the resurrection of Jesus. And I want us to put a scientific lens on the resurrection of Jesus. Because science, right, science is going to have a hard time with this one, with the resurrection. Did you know that historical books, actually, not the Bible, there's other historical books that actually have reference to a man named Jesus of Nazareth, right? If you go back to the Roman writers of the time, uh, that they actually wrote about a man named Jesus of Nazareth, and they write about the Romans scourging him, crucifying him, right, and putting him in the tomb. Then they actually talk about this guy came back to life and they didn't, they didn't know like how it happened. And so there's actually historical records of Jesus Christ outside of the Bible. There's historical records of a lot of the miraculous things that happened from the Bible, but there's other accounts, like just regular modern day people who were historians of the time, who were writing things down at the time, that wrote about some of the same things that happened in the Bible, okay? So when we start talking about the resurrection, this is a problem with science because science can't explain how someone who has died comes back to life. Did you know that? Like if science says you're dead, they can't explain how you came back to life, okay? They can think about it, they can speculate about it, but they can't actually get you to the point where they will teach you or show you how this person has come back to life. And so I just want us to think about this and, and reflect on it as we begin this. And we want, I want you to kind of allow yourself to enter into this story because it's a really important story. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important thing that happens in Christianity. It's the most important thing that, that Jesus does because it proves that everything we kind of know, everything we kind of believe about the world can be changed according to what God wants to do within it, Okay. And so I want to read this to you. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, a mother of James, and Solomon brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early in the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us to enter, enter in, from the entrance of the tomb? Can you imagine this? I never, thought, I never heard this part of the story until this year. They, they're asking this question like, who's going to roll the, the stone away for us? Why did they need someone to roll the stone away for them? How many of you have been to a funeral before? Anybody? Lately, right? They have the caskets now and they open up. Before this, they didn't have the caskets and stuff. They'd wrap the body in a cloth and they'd put these like oils on them or they'd put herbs and spices in them uh, and then they'd wrap them all up so that the bodies didn't smell really bad, right, as they were decaying. And where would they put the bodies? They'd put the bodies in a tomb and then they'd put a big stone in front of it, Okay. And so when they get to this, they're, they're asking the question, they're just kind of like nonchalantly like, oh, I wonder who's going to roll the stone away for us so we can anoint the body. And like, you know what I mean? This is just the conversation they're having, which seems very strange to me that they wouldn't have thought of this before they started going to the tomb. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh you know, they're trying to get the, uh, we can't do it, we'll come back tomorrow. You know, like that, that's, that's not the case, right? And, and so as they go, as they go, they uh, when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. Back as they, as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, "Do not be alarmed. You are looking for the Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He was raised. He's been raised. Here, uh, he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. This is the place that they laid him. So, isn't that interesting, right?" Like, this guy's just sitting there like, don't be afraid. Like, no big deal. Would you be freaking out in that moment if you watched them put the body of some dead person, whether it was Jesus or not, if it was your loved one, right? They put this person's body. Can you imagine? Just imagine this for a minute, right? Like, heaven forbid you go to a funeral and you bury your grandma or grandpa, and then the next day you, you show up at where you lit, and you're like, where'd they go? You know what I mean? Like, there's a, dirt, there's a hole where you had laid. And then they're like showing up at your house, and they're eating fish in front of you. I mean, we're hearing all these stories and we're hearing all these gospels of where Jesus is appearing to the disciples. And, and I think when we start thinking about like science with all this, you're like, how does a person walk around with holes in his hands, holes in his side, right? Holes in his feet, and he still can eat fish. It doesn't like do the Casper thing where it like falls out the bottom of him because he's a ghost, right? 
There's so much to these stories. Now, when you get to this point, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but I don't believe in any of it because I believe in science. And this is, a, this is actually a very common uh, thing right now is that people don't believe in God anymore. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the church and what she teaches because they have science, science that can prove things. Because science really can't prove this over here, science can prove this stuff over here. And so we're going we're gonna to go with what we can see, taste, touch, smell, experience, okay? Is truth based on your experience of it? For something to be true, do you have to experience it for it to be true or real or in existence? No, right? Can you give me an example of something that is real outside of your experience of it? Anyone? Yeah. The Civil War. Yeah, I was just in, uh, <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up. I was just in Charleston, South Carolina yesterday, and I was uh, there on vacation with my wife. And the South has a very different memory of the Civil War, okay? Like, like, and that's not to say that they're wrong, but they, think about this, okay? Like, all, you know how we have placards? Like, have you ever been, like, out to where Gettysburg is or where other more war memorials are, where the North is there? And they're like, this is the triumph, vic, triumph, vic, triumphant victory of, like, whatever northern general that was there. Down in the South, it's like, this is where Abraham Lincoln surrendered. You know, they're celebrating all these moments that, like, the North was losing the war. And all, it's just an interesting reality that now we even have perspective in the Civil War, right? If you're in the South, you see it as uh, like you didn't want to lose, right? You didn't want to surrender. You wanted to win, but you let the North did win the, the war. If you're in the North, you're like, we won, we're victorious, right? But here again, perspective, right? The reality is, is that the Civil War happened even though we, ha we weren't there. We, we didn't see it happen, right? We didn't experience it. We didn't fire a gun in it. We, no one we know really maybe even... Uh, fought in it, maybe a great, great, great ancestor, but you didn't actually meet that person, right? Uh, we could even talk about World War II. Does anyone have anyone in their family that still is alive from World War II? You know, World War II, really? Okay. World War II veterans are uh, far, few and far between because so many of them are very old now, right? Because World War II was so long ago. I'm guessing it's a grandparent. Yeah, so I mean there's not a lot of World War II veterans left, right? And so when those people who fought or worked or helped in that war are dead, we now are going to the history books, okay? We're going to what was, what was told or passed on. Um, science is one of those things that uh, it has grown, okay? There have been lots of discoveries in science, and it's, it's similar to this reality of that, like, truth, truth is something that is outside of our experience, but it is true, and that's called objective truth, Right? Like, objective truth would be, uh, how many of you have been to Japan before? But it's a place, right? I mean, none of us have been there. We've seen pictures and stuff. Is it really real? I mean, if we haven't experienced it, if we've never been there, maybe they're just lying to us. You know what I mean? And I'm sure the live stream people are like, I've been to Japan, you know, like it's real. But it is real. It's a real place. And objectively speaking, Japan exists, even though none of us in this room have been there, okay? Okay. Uh, none of us have gone there. None of us have experienced that place, but it, it exists because uh, it is true. And God, um, if God is all-powerful, if God is omnipotent, if he can do anything and everything, would God, God's existence, would he actually be God if he was based on our experience of him? If we believed in him or didn't believe in him? Like, if we don't believe in him, God, like, is, doesn't exist anymore. Can you, can you imagine if like one person was like, yeah, I don't think so. And then God just ceases to exist. No, like just because something is true objectively and we don't believe in it doesn't mean that that objective truth changes. It means that we just maybe don't believe in it or don't agree or don't think that that is true. Science, I want to define science for us because it kind of goes to this idea of seeking this truth. And I was looking up uh, I always, I love defining words. I love looking up definitions because it helps me understand them. When you say the word science, you've said that word a million times. Do you know what it means? You want to have a definition for science? If you had to define science? Live streamers, can they chat in? I don't know. They can email, email Joe. If you have a great definition of science, you get 20 extra bonus points uh, from me to you if you can define science, right? 
Uh, this is what it is. It's a noun, okay? So it's, uh, it's the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and the behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experience. And experiment, not experience. Sorry, said the wrong word. Experiment, right? So let me break this down again. So it's the intellectual and practical. So we use our brain, we think about it, we see it. Do you think a dog can do science? Think your dog could do science? You think they can go and get baking soda and vinegar and like use their little dog paws and pour it into the volcano and let it erupt chemical reactions, right? Maybe not that level of science, but maybe they can, you know, wherever your dog goes to the bathroom, the grass dies, you know what I mean? So that might be a scientific experience. I don't know, but I'm, the reality is, is no. No, they can't do science because they're, everything they do is based on reaction, right? Um, you pet them, they wag their tail. It's a habitual action that they're doing. They're, they're a habit. They're in the habit of when you whistle for them, they come. When you say sit, they know that they sit, put their little paw up, and then you'll give them a treat, right? Like, they're doing it out of habit. And kids, you know, this broccoli, the airplane, <laughs> we got an airplane. Like, th those things work only for a little bit of time, right? Your parents probably bribe you with things sometimes. I'm a parent. I can't, I'm not above it, okay? Like, I'm not above bribing my kids to do what I want them to do sometimes. How many people get paid for mowing the lawn or pay? Like, that's kind of a form of, like, payment, not bribery so much. But, like, there's an incentive, right? That you, you do this because you, you want what is at the end, the reward, if you will, okay? Science is about the intellectual, intellectual the thought and the physical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and the behavior of the physical and natural world. So there's lots of like facets of science, okay? What is microbiology? Does anyone know what microbiology is? No. Micro, small. Biology, study of like, you know, life, he, he, plants, animals, okay? So it's like little tiny microscopic study of life, okay? Microbiology. Who knows what, uh, you know, like aerospace or Aero, I don't know how, these, all these words are really above me. Like, I don't even do this kind of stuff normally. But when you, when you start thinking about, like, astrophysics, right? It's like what's happening outside of our atmosphere, okay? It's like astrophysics, it's out in space. But these are studies, these people, there's brilliant, brilliant people that study these things that are, I have no idea, I, I couldn't even start thinking or understand that kind of thing. Uh, or, or nuclear fission, right? Like, people have figured out how to take nuclear fission and, and make electricity, right? Or uh, let's just go back to really simple things because this is way easier for me to talk about. The light bulb, the light bulb, okay? Look up, there's light bulbs everywhere. Can you imagine the world without any lights? Can you imagine? No, you can't. Your whole life, you've always had lights. And we use lights for everything. That projector has a light bulb in it, right? These lights, those laser taggers have little light bulbs that, and then they're like lights up here and then it shocks you and you're like, oh, not doesn't shock you. It vibrates, I meant. But I'm right, we use light for everything. Beams of light, we use it all the time. Uh, imagine a world, and we just had the Easter vigil where it was just candles, okay? Like the whole church is lit by candles, except what? The ugly emergency lights, okay? Like the ugly exit signs are always on, even at the Easter vigil, okay? But can you imagine a church, and can you imagine our cathedral without any light except candles? Can you imagine how dark that would be, right? And then the lights flip on, or the candles get lit, and they light the whole church by candlelight. And that light is just so bright, right? The light bulb. What if, what if the light bulb, right? Who, who invented the light bulb? What? I heard someone say it. Thomas Edison, right? Now, what if Thomas Edison let anger run the show? You think we'd have a light bulb? Like after it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work again and it didn't work another time. Like, no, like he, he persevered through it, okay? And, and Thomas Edison created a light bulb. He created light. He created power. He figured out how power could go through the filaments in a light bulb to create light, okay? And so that's a very physical reality, right? That was a great invention. That was a great important thing. And we can physically, tangibly understand it, okay? We can see it. Science actually helps us understand the world, okay? It helps us understand who we are and it helps us understand the world. Now, there are things that, that science can't always explain, but 
it, it attempts to. And I, I love this quote. There's a quote from John Paul II uh, that a friend of mine sent to me when I was writing this talk. Uh, and, and I want to share it with you because John Paul II is so awesome. He was a pope a few popes back. Um, and, and he sent me this quote because it's, it's just such a good quote. And it talks about uh, that, if I can find it here, I should have had it pulled up. Bear with me one second. It's a quote that talks about faith and reason, okay? So when we talk about science, we're utilizing our reason. Emotions play into our reason, but reason is, is outside of just our emotions. Do you know that the color, the, a red car is bought more than any other car? Because people who buy red cars, it like feels good. And our emotions direct us, but at some point we have to get past that, right? Have you ever made a decision that was not based in emotion? Have you ever made a decision or a choice uh, that was, you knew it was good for you? but you didn't want to do it, like, not, like medicine, right? You take medicine when you feel sick, even though maybe it tastes awful, and your parents are like, take the medicine because it will make you feel better. And you're like, I don't want to, but you take it anyway, right? You didn't let your emotions stop you from taking the medicine, even though you knew it was going to taste awful and feel bad right in the moment. Sometimes, how many of you have ever had something where you get worse before you get better? You know, like physical therapy or something, like you, you break your leg, and then it's like it's a lot of pain, but you're going to do it anyway because you know the, the reward will be better. How many of you have played a sport or do an instrument or something where it's like you fatigue yourself a ton because you know that you want what you're going to get on the other side? And, and this is the reality of science as well, is that science helps prove the things that we uh, want to understand more fully, right? Uh, this guy with the light bulb, he wanted to create light, so he, he went after it and went after it and created a light bulb and created this ability then and then everyone just moved on and on. You can go through all the inventions throughout the course of human history and learn tons of stuff about uh, why science is important. But science was never meant to take the place of God. Science was never meant. Our, our brain, our reason was never meant to take the place of our faith. But it's happening often a lot of people are believing only in science. And if science can't prove it, if science can't understand it, then it's not real and it's not objective truth. It's not, uh, it's not true. But John Paul II says in a, in, a, in a document that he wrote, he says that reason and faith are like two wings of a bird. Have you ever seen a bird that has a broken wing, like at a raptor center or something? Why are they at the raptor centers, right? They're trying to heal that wing. But they can't be. They can't. They can never go back out uh, into nature. Why? Because they were, you know, hand-fed, or they they lived in a cage, or they they couldn't live in the wild. And so, if we don't have faith and we only have reason, we're kind of like that bird. We're like we can understand a lot of stuff just based on our reason and just based on science. But there's a whole half of the reality of the world that we'll never understand and never even touch, and we can never go out and understand the world, the fullest ability that we were created for, without faith, okay? So this bird, this bird example is really important because a lot of people try to fly with one wing. Can you imagine trying to, like, you get down, you're, in Del, you're at the airport, you're going to spring break, right? And they're sitting there, and they're like, all right, everybody, we're going to take off in just a few minutes. Yep, we don't have the right wing, but we're going we're gonna to give it a go. You know, and we're going we're gonna to give it a shot and see how it goes. Hopefully, we can just fly to the left a lot. You know, like, we'll just lean to the left. Hopefully, that'll, that'll do. You'd be like, uh, can I get off the plane? This is crazy. This is crazy. But sadly, that's how many, many people look at our world and say, well, if science can't prove it, if science doesn't understand it, then I don't, I don't agree and I don't believe it. Because we don't take what we know about science and apply it to our faith because sometimes uh, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's, it's, it's based in faith. Faith is something uh, outside uh, of always touching and feeling. Thomas is one of my favorite characters of the story, right? And Thomas, the, the reading about Thomas, the doubting Thomas, how many of us have ever doubted? the Lord. How many of us have doubts in faith? I've, I've had doubts in my faith. I, I still have doubts in my faith. Thomas was too. And, and Jesus shows up one time and he's like, Thomas, you were doubting last time. Put your hand in my side. Put your fingers in the holes in my hands. Jesus comes to us if we allow him to prove that he is real. He comes to us because he wants us to fly with both wings. And we can't, we can't fly with both wings if we only live on this side, if we only live within science. One of my favorite places in the whole wide world is Lourdes, France. 
I've been to Lourdes, France six times. I've done lots of mission trips over there, and I've worked in the sanctuary. How many people know what Lourdes, France is? Anyone know what Lourdes is? St. Bernadette? Yeah. Our Lady of Lourdes, she, a Marian apparition happened there. St. Bernadette was a little girl. She was walking. Uh, she appeared to St. Bernadette uh, 18 times and then helped this girl, the Bernadette. She found a spring of water that the water is still flowing out of there today. And this was in 1858 that she found this spring of water. And the water is still flowing out today. And people who bathe in this water or are dipped in this water with sicknesses are healed miraculously. Science can't explain it. They actually have 40 people on a board that try to disprove the miracles that come across the desk. Because there's this big, long process you can write up. Like, So if your grandma went to Lourdes, France and had terminal cancer and then was miraculously healed, you could write up a big report and you could send in the photos and the medical reports and everything, and then they'd have all these doctors look at it. And they have 40 people on this, on this and one of them is an atheist because they don't want uh, the science and the faith thing being messed with. They want to make sure that they're showing a full understanding. And so as they look through these records and these medical things, uh, they determine if they're actually miraculous or not. And there's been 63, I think, or now there's 65, I think, miracles that have been approved by this 40-person medical board uh, that, that they, science cannot prove why. And it shows medically, and you can actually look on their website and you can see some of these things. I met one of the men uh, that actually, his name is Massimo, and he was a young man and he had terminal cancer and he was in a full body cast. And he goes to Lord's France, Right? And as he gets to Lord's France, he's in this full body cast. And when I worked in the baths, we actually like lowered people into the water and stuff because they, they have baths, that like big tub things that they put the water in and then you can go in and dip your body in and sickness and all that kind of stuff. And so they lower this man in and they take him out. And as they take him out, he's like, I'm healed, which a lot of people say that they're healed, right? Because we all want to be healed. We all want to be uh, fixed. We don't want to be in pain. We don't want to be sick. And so he says he's healed. And so they bring him back. Uh, to his hospital room, right? And this man was on tons of medication and they weren't really feeding him except through an IV. And so he's like, no, I'm healed. He's in a full body cast. And he's like, I'm so hungry. Please give me something to eat. I've been healed. None of them believe him. They're just like, yeah, that's what everybody says, like that you, you want to be healed so bad. So then in the middle of the night, okay, this guy somehow got out of his bed and he's like tiptoeing in a full body cast, like down the hallway, trying to find something to eat, right? Because this guy is like healthy, he's healed, he's actually re like recovered from this terminal cancer. And this doctor goes and takes him and they, they scan his whole body. And I've actually seen the scans. There's one scan on this side and you can see all the cancer in his body. You can just see all the gross, like, you know, whatever scan it is that shows where the cancer is. It's in all of his little lymph, lymph nodes and just it's all over his whole body. And they're like, you're going to die any minute, right? And this is what it looks like. It just looks gross. Then the next scan, and it's right here on the other side, there's literally no cancer in his whole body. And one was taken like a week earlier, and this was like the day of that he was saying all these things, right? Now, how was he healed, right? Like, how is it possible that cancer, we know how cancer is aggressive and it eats away, and most of the time if you have cancer and you don't kill it with chemotherapy or some other thing, some other kind of medication or drug, that cancer will kill you. And so he was just dipped in some water. And here he is, healed. I met this man. I met this man. This man was alive. He was working in the train stations. And he told us his story in the train station. And then we went to the, like, they have this hallway where there's all the people who have been miraculously healed. And it shows their story and all these different things. You can see that on the wall. And so my brain is kind of thinking to myself, like, how can I believe this? How can I believe this scientifically? Like, I can't prove it. I can't test it. I can't understand why he didn't die, except through faith. Except that if I believe in God, if I believe that God created me, loves me, and has some ability over all of his creation, that he could heal. I want to tell you one more story. I think I have time for it. Uh, my, my son, my second born son, his name is Fulton. And his, he's named after Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And there's actually a little boy, you can, you can look up on YouTube, this kid's name is Fulton, and I read this really inspiring book, and it was, uh, it's called like, I can't remember, it's something about 60 Minutes, okay? So this, this kid, this mom was pregnant, I think she, she was pregnant with her fifth kid, and she didn't know, but she had a lot of, comp this baby had a lot of complications, okay? And so, uh, like, right away, right as she was going to deliver the baby, they realized that the baby is not doing well, and they rush her to the hospital, and the baby's born with all these problems, with all these defects, with all these 
uh, terrible things. Uh, and, and then I think right as soon as the baby is actually born, the baby is pronounced dead. They try, oh, that's what it is. He, he, he was born, stillborn, right? And they try to do CPR. They try to keep the baby alive. And after like 20, 30 minutes of trying to do this, they realize like there's, there's just no hope. There's no hope. This baby has passed away. We're going to call time of death, whatever, right? And so then it's, it's like 60 minutes from that point, And the mom is holding her dead baby in her arms and praying with this baby. And multiple doctors, physicians, nurses, everyone kind of came in uh, and checked the baby for heartbeat, heart tones, vital signs, breathing, all that kind of stuff. Nothing, 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 right? And she just, she keeps praying and asking for the intercession of Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen was an archbishop uh, back in the 50s. He was one of the pioneers of middle, uh, of evangelization with multimedia. He was, he was on the, my grandmother, who's not even Catholic, would watch Fulton Sheen on the TV because there's only five channels. Can you imagine? There's only five channels. Only five things to watch on the television. Um, and he was one of them. And, and she kept asking for the intercession of Fulton Sheen. Inter- please help me make my baby healed. Help my baby become alive. 60 minutes after the baby was pronounced dead, after the baby was born, there was no life in this baby. The baby starts to breathe. The heart starts to beat, and the baby starts to come back to life. And the doctors are like, there's this whirlwind of doctors and nurses. Everybody comes back like, oh my gosh, how is this happening? This is impossible. There's no possible way that this is happening. And they're like, well, even though the baby is breathing and has heart tones and stuff, it, the baby's going to be brain dead. I mean, there's no way that the brain could be functioning, that the heart would work, that the lungs, the liver, your baby's going to die soon. Like, I would prepare for the baby to die in a day or two or whatever. You can actually watch YouTube videos of this kid uh, on, online. Like he's a regular two-year-old, three-year-old, I think he's four now. And he was dead for 60 minutes, literally 60 minutes. His mom hold, held him in her arms and he just came back to life. Science has no possible explanation for this. I mean, if you, if you want to grow up and try to prove how that's not something to do with faith alone, like... I would love for you to do that, but it's like that bird, guys. Reason and faith are the two wings of a bird, and they help us fly to the heights of reality. If you're looking for sources to help you as you kind of walk through this, because faith, uh, faith and science, it seems to me they keep, there, there's a greater divide between faith and science than there shouldn't be. Because most of the great scientists of history had faith. And this book right here, it's, it actually just got this for my kids. It's an amazing book. It's 25 Catholic scientists, mathematicians, and super smart people. And I was reading this book. It, it's awesome. It's such a cool book. And it's all these different people that are either on their way to sainthood, or they were priests, or they were religious sisters, and they were brilliant, brilliant people. And they talk about how these people highly influenced science, highly influenced mathematics radically transformed the world, actually helped Albert Einstein. One of these guys helped Albert Einstein with some of his great theories, and he's thought to be one of the greatest uh, scientific minds in all of human history. Albert Einstein was supposed to be this genius. Well, it was, it was one of the people in this book that actually showed him one thing that made all of his ideas actually be able to come tr- to light, to understand. And so science and faith and reason and intellect, they all play well together. They're like good friends. And the more we kind of separate them, the less science is actually focused on the truth anymore. And it's starting to be focused on uh, what I like and what I don't like, what I want to do with science and what I don't want to do with science. Because the further it gets away from faith, the less and less science becomes uh, a moral issue. And we start asking the question, can I do this, not should I do this? And that's where science becomes very problematic. And so as we get to the end of this conversation, as we start to get uh, to the end of this, this time together, what I want us to remember is that God allowed the human mind and he, he revealed to us more and more and more and continues to reveal beautiful things to us so that we can believe in him more fully, so that we can understand who God is more fully. Science actually helps men and women understand God more fully. Because science cannot give you, like I said earlier, the relationship that God wants to have with you. But it can inform and help you understand that 
You need something outside of what this world has to offer. For so long and for so many years, I spent my life trying to find happiness in everything that the world had to offer me. And in all reality, the only place that I found true, lasting peace and joy is in faith. Is following the Lord who died on a cross and rose from the dead three days later. Science is not going to get you where you want to go to the extent that you want to go unless you allow faith to inform your reason. Unless you allow your faith to help you become fully who you're called to be. I'm not saying you shouldn't think. I'm not saying you shouldn't invent. I'm not saying you shouldn't be a scientist and do crazy awesome things for the world. But just let God be part of it. Because then it will be even more awesome and more grand and even more awe-striking and even more important for the salvation of souls and other people because it's not just focused on you and what you can achieve. What if the guy that created the light bulb, Thomas Evison, kept it just for himself? Didn't teach anyone else how to make a light bulb. We wouldn't have these light bulbs, right? Or running water? Man, thank you for that guy, right? Who likes outhouses? You know what I'm saying? Like, don't keep these great gifts that God is going to give to you through your mind, through your reason, through your intellect to yourself. But use them to transform the world, to give glory to God, and to help the name of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed all throughout the entire world. Because God has something great in store for each and every one of you. And so I hope that this has helped you realize that God is necessary. That science can only get you to like this point, And then it's faith to the heavens, to the heights, right? You can't prove. And so don't just go here and stop because then you're like that bird that can only try to fly with one wing. And no one, no one in their right mind wants to stop at that glass ceiling. So allow God to shatter that glass ceiling and allow God to continue to help you see uh, the reality of him through prayer, through study, through understanding of all that he is, okay? You guys have any questions? I have a few more minutes here. Any questions about this? Any, any thoughts that have come up about what we've talked about? I know I talked about a lot of stuff. And I know it was kind of like here, there, and everywhere. Um, as I was thinking about this, the, the thing that I really want to get at is that faith and reason are absolutely like together. And when you start to separate these things, uh, that's when it becomes problematic, okay? Uh, it's, it, it, it's dangerous to try to just do science because what ends up happening is uh, you get to the point, you get to the point where you become the, the goal of all the science, right? Like your, grand, your grandeur, your reputation, your uh, awesomeness, you, how many prizes you can win. But when you have faith incorporated into all that we do, then we do all, all the decisions we make, all the choices we make, all the inventions, all the work, all the efforts that we put in uh, come for the glory of God. And that's absolutely necessary. That's absolutely where you're going to find your greatest peace and joy. Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, so when you go to the, some of these stories in the Bible, uh, you can't take them completely factually, literally. Okay, like, And two, you think about when was the first calendar, the calendar we have today with 365 days, when was that even created? Do you know? It was like the 14, 1500s that we got the like 350, 365 days with the leap year and all that kind of stuff. It's actually in this book, they talk about that calendar. And before that, uh, the calendar was wrong and there was about 10 days that was wasted every year or something like that. But so when we talk about the seven days of creation, they're, they're, they're talking about days, but they're saying like more of moments of time, okay? So like the first day was th in, in this moment, in this time, uh, we don't know how much time it was because God is outside of time, right? God in, in his creation uh, is outside of all time. He created this at this moment and then this at this time, and then this in this day. And it's just showing, it's kind of ordering and processing how God created. And I think sometimes we get so stuck, I'm like, well, was it a 24-hour day? Like, why did God need to rest? Because isn't he God? He's pretty much like all-powerful. Like, why does he need a day of rest? Because God does everything 
for us to be able to understand him more. He knew, he knew that every seven days, I mean, God, when he's created everything, right? He knew that he was going to give us Jesus and that the mass would be on the seventh day, right? Like he knew that that was coming. And outside of all of time, he knew that we'd be sitting here right now today and mass would be on Sunday, uh, which, which was the seventh day, if you will, or the beginning of the week. It's, it's like the day that we received Jesus and there's a seven day week, right? And so in all of this, God knew that was going to happen. And so uh, with that, how do, you, how do you explain like the seven days of creation? Uh, we don't know how long each of those days were, if you will. And it doesn't mean that uh, it was seven exact days. Uh, and, and two, you can go into the whole like, well, when did dinosaurs fit in there? And, you know, carbon dating and all that kind of stuff. And, and sometimes we get so bogged down in what the Bible doesn't say that we forget what the Bible does say. And what does the Bible say? It says that the greatest creation that God created out of all time was humanity. Why? Because he created us in his image and his likeness. And he wanted us to be like him. He created uh, us for himself. And that's what the creation story is really trying to get us to look at and see. It's not so much like, all the things that you're asking about, it's more of like, what is the Bible trying to get at? The main point of the creation story is that God loved so much that he created. And in that creation, he created us. And he wants to have that relationship with us. If you're looking for more resources specifically on that, there's actually uh, Father Spitzer. He's a a Catholic priest. He has a website called Credible Catholic. Are you guys going to give those? Maybe you can put those resources out. They're all free and they're super, super awesome. They're actually, it's a seven-part study on all of this, how science and faith work together. And they actually are really great friends and they don't tear each other apart. They actually build each other up. Um, And so Father Spitzer, Credible Catholic, talks a lot about that. Uh, And so, again, it's not so much how creation took place uh, or reading the Bible completely literally because this is not like a scientific work. Genesis is not a scientific work that exemplifies how all this actually happened. It's, It's more of a story on how God loves so much that he created all of us. And the fact of the matter is, is that you're here right now, right? Adam and Eve doesn't have a ton to do with your day to day right now. Does it? Like, I don't think it does, except that God loved then, he loves now, and how we relate to God through the resurrected Jesus Christ, how we give glory to God through our choices, actions, thoughts, and words, that's really how we participate in the story of salvation throughout the entire history of humankind. And so don't allow yourself or Satan to bog you down in question, in, in the like questions that are really I don't know, tough to answer, uh, always can continue to be brought up. Like, <laughs> there's this question a kid would ask me all the time. Can, if God is so powerful, can he create something so big that he can't even lift it, lift it up? And you can, like, ruin your mind trying to think about stuff like that. Like, it just, because it's like, how do you answer that question? You know, and, and I think we get bogged down sometimes in those things instead of thinking about, well, if God did create, if God is real, how can God interact with me today? If God did die on a cross and then rose from the dead and he's invited me into a relationship with him, man, I better start thinking about that. I better start think, praying about that. I better ask the Lord to enlighten, to show, to explain that to me, right? Uh, how do dinosaurs fit into all this? Well, I mean, you can think about that for like a really long time. And the answer is we don't really know completely, right? Like, we don't know how Adam and Eve were the first two actual parents. Like, there's all these things. Jonah actually get eaten by a whale and then gets spit out on the beach. Well, you know, the word whale actually is translated from the Greek sheol, which is like the place of the dead. So, I mean, there's just a lot of like realities that sometimes we can get bogged down and messed with in our mind that we, we miss the main point of the story. That our, that our, our mind and our intellect was given to us by God to help us see, understand, and realize that God is outside of what we can possibly understand and so that it takes faith for us to have a relationship with Jesus, with the Lord. And that faith was given to you at your baptism. It was built up by your first Eucharist and it will ultimately be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit as you get confirmed. And so these sacraments are not just things you go through and you're like, oh yeah, I got a check mark. 
They truly are helping you become the full man and woman that you are called to be, that God wants you to be for this world. I'll end with this one more quote. Uh, it says that John Paul II, again, one of my favorite saints, he said, that every person who is born radically transforms human history. So just because you exist, guys, just because you are alive, human history will never, ever be the same. And so the choice is up to you. What are you going to do with the life you've been given to radically help transform and make the world a place that is more full of joy, more full of love, more full of happiness, so that you can help people become who they're called to be and ultimately, hopefully, be with you for all eternity in heaven. Amen? All right. Why don't we pray? Unless there's more questions. Any questions? All right, why don't we just close in a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we just thank you so much. I uh, thank you for allowing me to come here today. I thank you for all the young people here, all those of you that are live streaming. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that your confirmations, that your faith, that, that all that you are doing to prepare yourself for holiness uh, might continue to help uh, you become the saint you're called to be. Lord, pour your grace out on each and every one of us. Help us to become... Uh, the young man or young woman that we're called to be, uh, to be a light to the world, to be the salt of the earth. We ask you, Lord, to help us to use our reason, our intellect, our brains, uh, to think more, to study more, to invent, to be creative. Uh, use us, Lord. Use our, our intellect, our mind, our will. Uh, help us to become all that this world needs so that we can become a saint, Lord, that we can become uh, the person we're called to be and be with you for all eternity in heaven. We turn to uh, the doctors of the church. We turn to the saints that have gone before us that were much smarter than us. We just ask them for their prayers uh, right now. And we just give you glory, Lord, as we pray together. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, a world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I think it's laser tag time.